How can we talk to indigenous peoples and download their knowledge without really messing up their, their system? Welcome to the Greener Grass podcast from Bluebird Botanicals. I'm your host, Lex Pelger. Emma Chasen comes from a long line of herbal witches. Her great-grandmother was a Strega Verde, and Emma herself teaches people about the magic of cannabis. Her journey took her from oncology research to managing a dispensary, and finally to cannabis education. Equipped with a biology degree, and with her work rooted in a traditional, ancestral respect for the life of plants, Emma teaches businesses and individuals what they need to know about cannabis so they can nurture a good relationship between their customers and their plants. Today we get to learn a little bit of that knowledge from her work, and so I hope you enjoy this talk with Emma Chasen. This show is brought to you by Bluebird Botanicals, to spread education about cannabis and other things on the greener side of life. Bluebird CBD oil comes from farms in southern Colorado and is grown using only water, soil, and sunlight. Go to bluebirdbotanicals.com for more info. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to have Emma Chasen on the show, a cannabis science educator out of Portland. Thanks for coming on. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And so now you're doing cannabis education and consultancy out that way. Um, But I was curious about how you got started on this path. Um, When you were young, did you always know you wanted to be working with plant medicines and learning about these kind of things? I've always had a really deep interest in plant medicine. I actually come from a pretty strong Italian matriarchal line of women who have worked with plant medicine for generations. My great-grandma was known as a Strega Verde, which directly translates to Green Witch in Italy. And when she emigrated from Italy to New York City, she continued to act as the kind of like local plant witch for the Italian immigrants there. And so it's always kind of been in my ancestry and in my DNA. And my mother is also very much involved and interested in plant medicine. Uh, I grew up drinking chlorophyll and, and taking many medicinal herbs and really approaching or using an integrative um practice in terms of Western medicine and, and plant medicine uh, growing up. And so I've, I've always been familiar with it. Um, it wasn't until my freshman year at Brown University that I took a freshman seminar called Botanical Roots of Modern Medicine that I realized that I could actually make a career out of it. I had gone to school to pursue uh, pre-medical studies, a degree in biology, and then eventually go on to get my MD. And when I took this seminar, I just opened my eyes to um, the actual possibility of, of really pursuing plant medicine and a more integrative, holistic wellness practice as a viable career. And so what was it like to be studying ethnobotany and medicinal plant research at a place like Brown? It was amazing. I love Brown. I could sing Brown's praises forever because they really do give you such freedom to do whatever you want. So there wasn't even a botany program at Brown when I was there, but I went to the Dean of Biology and I said, hey, I I really want to devise my own track within the biology program within the biology department to be able to fully focus on medicinal plant research and ethnobotany, since that is what I'm really passionate about. And the dean said, great, do it. Create a list of courses that you want to take. Uh, It doesn't have to be only in biology. It could also be in other uh, areas of study, like environmental science and and, um, research studies and even some economics and and stuff like that. Uh, And I was able to kind of devise my own course of study within the biology program. I had an amazing mentor who he was the horticultural specialist on staff. He ran the greenhouse and and I was able to to really study under him um, rather 
rather intimately, which was amazing to download all of his knowledge. Unfortunately, I could not formally study cannabis while I was at Brown due to legality issues, but I really was able to develop quite a foundational understanding of uh, plant chemistry and pharmacognosy. So the way that the compounds in a medicinal plants matrix interact with our physiology. It's interesting to hear about you getting into this field because in some ways it's it's a newer field. You know, it's only been a couple of generations where we really look at the relationships between plants and people. Um, who are some of the uh, early explorers of this that kind of resonate with you as you were studying ethnobotany? Mm, so really a, a lot of the, the people who have been doing this kind of work of uh, looking at the way that um, indigenous peoples have used medicinal plants over centuries have been anthropologists. And a lot of the works that I did read while I was in school was about anthropologists going into the field and working with people who were using medicinal plants. Um, the, the anthropologists who went and worked with uh, the mushrooms in Oaxaca, Mexico, the, the magic mushrooms and kind of popularized that. I believe it was in the, the 60s, uh, 70s, um, did, did quite a number on the indigenous population there in, in not such a positive way. And so actually a lot of the anthropologists who I did study it was kind of an example of, okay, how not to do this? <laughs> how, how can we talk to indigenous peoples and respect um, what, what they're doing and, and download their knowledge without really messing up their, their system? I mean, for example, the, the anthropologists who went and studied the magic, magic mushrooms, um, they, they created like quite a buzz, quite a tourism around uh, this type of plant medicine that then uh, concurrently made the, the mushrooms and, and the ceremony uh, lose its meaning, dilute its meaning a little bit. Um, a lot of the people who I did look to to, to really give me a more positive, positive example of how it's done, um, one of them was my mentor at Brown. Um, his name was Fred Jackson. He's really amazing. He has gone down to South America to study with indigenous tribes in the Amazon down there um, quite a number of times. And, and I really just loved his approach and, and being very, very respective of the, the ceremonies and the, the traditions and the cultures and the people down there. That's a big uh, thing for me. Um, and I also was lucky enough to have a uh, people in my life as well that I've grown up with, a particular family friend who is an anthropologist who works intimately with uh, Native Americans and plant medicine, as well as uh, curanderismo, so the, the Native indigenous uh, folk healing practice of Mexico. And I was able to go down and, and study curanderismo with him and uh, a biologist, a healer, down, down in Oaxaca as well and download that knowledge while, again, making sure to, to respect the culture, to respect the people. It really does have to, for me, incorporate both of those things that like utmost respect for, for the people, for these cultures, for uh, these, these communities that have passed down this knowledge. Um, and then also on, on the other side of things, just trying to download and, and learn as much of that knowledge as possible, of course, with the, um, with the permission of the communities and, and the healers there. That sounds like a really uh, important aspect of all of this work. Absolutely. It, it makes me think uh, Michael Harner, who has that great book, Hallucinogens and Shamanism. He collected mm. a lot of this early work. I like something that I'd seen him say where the first generation of anthropologists came into indigenous communities and said, oh, and they're they're taking this plant and they seem to really think it's a great thing. I've never taken it myself, but, you know, they think it's great. Uh, then the second generation would come in and they actually would take some of these plant medicines and, you know, have a gringo coming in and taking ayahuasca. They really finally understood why these were so sacred to people and the anthropology got better and more respectful after things like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And it does come with, with very much um, that permission from the community of you are entering into our space, into our ceremony. It's a very intentional process. Um, it is not 
it's not the way that we approach plant medicine or have approached plant medicine um, from a, a kind of like white perspective because it just doesn't follow the the allopathic model of you take this one particular compound and then you achieve these set of results and maybe some of them are, are more negative and so you take more compounds um, instead it it's holistic it involves the spiritual emotional mental physical community and it's it's important to get the permission of the local people who are who are doing that and so from your side, it's fascinating. You went from work like that and then on to oncology trials and doing yes. very hard-boiled science in a very traditional way. Uh, what was that like to be doing that kind of work? That was hard. It was, it was interesting. I made the decision to work for um, the Brown University Oncology Research Group to help coordinate clinical oncology trials nationwide because I... I naively, somewhat naively thought that that could be my point of access for cannabis. It was uh, 2014, 2015 at the time. And so on the East Coast, this was in Rhode Island, cannabis was just starting to gain traction. Uh, it was just starting to to come out as this potentially really miraculous uh, compound, these mirac this miraculous plant medicine. And so I... I joined um, that team and and did help to coordinate oncology trials, but it it was grueling. I mean, unfortunately, it was not the place where I I could have that impact, where I could bring cannabis into the space. There was a brilliant professor who did propose a cannabis trial to my department and the my supervisor just laughed him out of the office, didn't even give him the time of day. And to me, just after spending uh, so much time seeing the billion dollar pharmaceutical after billion dollar pharmaceutical trial getting pushed through to to have that complete lack of respect for somebody who's proposing a cannabis trial uh, was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And, and that's when I decided to move on from that space. Um, it was It was just really jarring to be so involved in that kind of work and see how much of that work is for profit. And it, it just didn't sit well with me. And so ultimately, I, I decided to leave. Wow, up and quit. Yep, just up and quit and left and packed up my car and drove across the country. <laughs> so it was uh, Rhode Island to Portland, huh? So it was Rhode Island to uh, stop over in New York. I am a born and raised New Yorker. Stop over in New York, collect my things for a, about a month, and then uh, drive across the country to Portland. Yeah. How did you find the Portland scene? And what did you start doing once you got there? So I had actually never been to Portland when I decided to move here, <laughs> which <laughs> is um, it, worked out, it worked out really well um, for me luckily. Um, but I, I just knew that I wanted a, a different adventure. I mean, I'm a born and raised East coaster. I had grown up in New York, spent five years in Rhode Island, going to school and then working for the oncology research group. And I just wanted something different. And to me, um, it, it was a, a low risk kind of move. Um, we, I was able to convince my best friend from college to move with me, which was awesome. And we rented a month's kind of vacation rental in Portland, just to to see how it went, see if we liked the city, see if we could find permanent housing, permanent work. Um, and if not, I mean, the, the idea was, okay, well, we'll move back to New York, uh, where all of our peers are working in some kind of marketing and, and just do that if all else fails. And, and so we got to Portland, we we got to our vacation rental and I immediately fell in love with the city. I, I just absolutely love the access to nature, the food, the wine, the beer, the community, uh, and of course the cannabis. And I had not necessarily um, been like super invested in getting a job in the cannabis industry right away, but I did need a job. And uh, it I arrived in Portland very serendipitously about a month and a half before early onset of adult use sales here in Oregon, meaning that it the industry was still medical, but uh, 
in October 2015, so I arrived August 2015, October 2015, the industry was going to allow uh, people of 21 plus to purchase a limited amount of cannabis still in the while still in the the medical industry before fully transitioning to recreational adult use sales. And so a ton of businesses were hiring in the cannabis scene. And I was able to secure a butt tending job at Pharma, which is a really uh, now a really popular dispensary here in Portland that takes a more scientific approach to cannabis at the time. Um, I had no idea of, of pharma's reputation. I mean, it was, it still didn't have much of a reputation because it was a very small medical shop. Um, and, and I thought I was only going to be there for like a couple of months just to kind of land on my feet, make some money while finding a, another job that was better. But, uh, I, I started working there and just became really inspired by their approach, started learning a ton and found that I had a, quite a knack for bud tending and that I really loved it. And you even got voted bud tender of the year in 2016, <laughs> correct? I did. I did. I was voted uh, Portland's best bud tender in 2016 by uh, the Willamette Week readers poll, which was very, very nice. I, it is quite an honor. That is an honor. And even more so, it, you moved up quickly at Pharma. You were general manager there after just a couple of months? Yes. Yeah. So just a few months after I started bud tending, I did get promoted to general manager, which uh, was an amazing learning opportunity. I mean, I, I was given a lot of freedom by the owners to really run the shop how I pleased, which uh, was an, an honor and uh, an awesome learning experience. And I also was the GM during the regulatory transition from uh, being governed by the OHA in the medical industry to being governed by the OLCC, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission in the adult use recreational industry. So it was a lot of uh, transitions. It required a lot of um, malleability in my approach because we would get new regulations every day, but it, it allowed me to really learn uh, some incredible skills that I still use in my work now as a consultant for these businesses. Hmm. And that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I think the weirdness of these laws is always so fascinating. And so what was it like to witness that transition of governance um, of this industry in Oregon? It was crazy. It was who thinking back to it, just how many times we had to pull all the product off the shelves or had to put only this certain amount of product. And we would get just memos um, that basically would go into effect immediately. That would be like, all this product has to get pulled or these companies you can no longer work with, or these are new uh, procedures that you have to abide by to remain in compliance. And it was a, a very tumultuous time as most transitions are. Uh, I, I tell people who I work with in this industry all the time that if you do want to own and operate a business that handles the plant in any way that does require a cannabis license from the, the city um, and the state, make sure that you are okay with change because a lot of change will come, um, not only in the kind of uh, regulatory transitions that are constant, but also in the, the businesses that, that come online, that fold, that, uh, that redefine, redesign their approach, redefine, redesign their products. I mean, there, there's so much variability in the cannabis industry. And it was exciting because it was a kind of a constant thing to keep up with. Um, but ultimately it, it did drain me. Um, it did drain me a bit. And so that was, I, I did, uh, the general manager thing for just over a year. And during that entire year was the transition year. And so I, I stepped down from that role, um, just after a year because it, it was quite draining. Whew, that does sound like a lot. Um, <laughs> And, and I would be curious, uh, as someone who is there on the front lines working with consumers so much, what would be the laws or regulations that you think are the most important uh, to have in place to make it uh, safe and knowledgeable for a consumer that walks in and doesn't know much about this stuff? Mm, so that is really uh, going to be a, a focus of staff training 
And a lot of retailers, a lot of businesses in general in the cannabis industry do not provide their employees with any comprehensive onboarding training whatsoever. And that is inexcusable to me. I mean, from a security standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, your uh, your bud tenders, your retail cannabis associates, employees, they have the power to really make or break your shop, your business. I mean, if they are out of compliance, then your business gets a violation that potentially could mean that it's shut down forever. And something, uh, it could be something as simple as like making sure your employees are wearing their name tag, making sure your employees are appropriately and effectively checking ID, making sure your employees are not making any claims around cannabis. And then of course, we also need to take that a step further in looking at uh, really training these people, these employees on the fundamentals of cannabis science, on product knowledge and information, on dosing strategies, on storage practices, and also on how to best deal with and approach uh, the consumer market that is looking for help with cannabis, but often does not know anything and is coming to these people, to these bud tenders, uh, looking for knowledge. They're using these people as their one reliable source of cannabis information, usually because their doctors can't give them any type of information. And that's quite a large responsibility to put on uh, somebody who is making typically minimum wage uh, at at a dispensary, at a retail shop. And so in my opinion, we do need to empower these employees, these bud tenders with the knowledge to best serve the consumer market. And that would look like the the fundamentals of cannabis science, the Cannabis 101 that does incorporate um, ways to recommend dosing strategies and product knowledge and information, um, as well as really learning the the finesse of the approach, how to best interact with your customers, how to form that connection, how to create space for sometimes vulnerable conversations to, to open up around medical concerns. And so you became the director of education here. And it seems like one of the things Pharma really became leader on is using the words chemotype to talk about cannabis cultivars and trying to stay away from the sativa, indica, false dichotomy. And I was curious how you explain that to people come in and saying that they want to get a sativa to wake them up and an indica to put them to sleep. Yes. So this is a perfect example of really marrying the the scientific integrity of cannabis, but um, providing training in like the, the finesse of the approach, because with customer service, you never want to tell people that they're wrong. People really do not like being told that, uh, that they're wrong and and in customer service, the customer is always right. So how do we uphold the scientific integrity of cannabis um, while while giving the consumer the best experience possible. And you are absolutely correct that at Pharma and in my um, approach, I continue to speak a lot about this Indica Sativa myth, that Indica and Sativa are not terms that we can look to to definitively predict consistent experience. An indica will not consistently deliver uh, a relaxing experience. A sativa will not consistently deliver an uplifting experience. Everything on the market is currently hybridized. Um, And so really, we must look to the chemotype of cannabis, meaning the chemical compounds found inside of the plant matrix in order to determine effect. And that makes sense because what we are consuming when we consume cannabis is not the, the plant morphology. It's not the way that the plant is growing in terms of the the indica and sativa uh, definitions. Instead, we are consuming the actual compounds found inside of the plant matrix. And those are interacting with enzymes and receptors in our body to, to make us feel a certain type of way, to make us have a certain experience. However, that being said, if a customer comes into the shop and says, hey, look, I want a, a super... Indica. I want something that's really indica dominant. I would never recommend an employee to say, well, actually you're wrong. Let me tell you that indica does not equal a a relaxing experience because of yada, yada, yada. Instead, what, what I teach in my trainings is to 
to really follow up with another question. So if you have somebody who's coming in saying, yes, I want something that's super indica dominant, ask them what type of experience they're looking for. Because indica dominant can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, it, it covers quite a wide range of experience for for the way that people think about that definition. And so um, ask them, well, are you looking for something to really knock you out, to make you super sleepy? Do you want something that will just be kind of chill, help you relax at the end of the day? Um, and really push for a uh, a reframing of the conversation in terms of uh, language that describes an experience. So push your push your customer with these kinds of questions to say, well, I, I want something that will knock me out. I want something that will make me really sleepy. And then you can pull out a product that um, you think will make them really sleepy and explain why. Again, never using the terminology indica or sativa. Instead, explain that, well, this cultivar, this variety has a good concentration of THC in there, which can make you drowsy. It also has some terpenes in there, uh, a particular terpene called myrcene, maybe. That's also found in IPAs. So think when you drink a few IPAs and you get a little drowsy, of course, that's due in part to alcohol content, but it's also due to this compound called myrcene that does provide a drowsy effect. And so it's also found in this cannabis cultivar. Um, and, and it may make you feel a similar type of way. Really have that conversation with them. Explain why you are recommending this product based on the compounds. You as an employee, you as a bud tender, never have to say indica sativa while you're conducting this explanation, but you also never have to tell your customer that they are wrong for using indica sativa. And the hope is that with this kind of dialogue, um, maybe the, the customer takes home this variety that you recommended. They go home, they have the best night's sleep of their life, and they come back the next time and they say, oh my God, I, I talked to this person and they gave me an incredible recommendation and they said that there was this compound myrcene in there and so I want, I want that compound again. Um, and, and that's where I'm looking to really shift, shift the dialogue from the Indica Sativa to looking at more of the, the compounds, to looking at the chemotype, just by planting those little educational seeds, sprinkling the seeds. So that way, um, maybe maybe the next time they come in or, or as this particular customer thinks about their own experience, their own relationship with cannabis, they can start to reframe it for themselves. That's great. A, a nice way to, to help people get it. Um... And I like that you mentioned myrcene too, just because I assume another big part of explanations is letting people know what this terpene profile is and how rich it is in cannabis. How do you explain that to people who haven't heard about terpenes before? Yes. So terpenes are, are big. They're having their kind of moment of fame right now and they will continue to, which is awesome. I love terpenes and I do think that it is really easy to explain it to people because we interact with terpenes every single day. And and the way that I define it for those people is that terpenes, they are the aromatic compounds found in all plants. So they give plants their smell, but they also correlate to certain physiological responses. And then I'll, I'll typically draw an analogy because I find that helps people the most. So I invite people to think of the experience when they bust open a citrus fruit in the morning or they're cleaning their house with um, a really citrus smelling cleaning solution and they feel awake and maybe a little euphoric and they get that little like mm, lift. Well, that's because of a compound. That's because of a terpene called limonene. And that terpene is found in the rinds of your citrus fruits and it does give a, a euphoric experience because it actually interacts with your serotonin and dopamine receptors. And limonene is also abundantly found in cannabis. And so think if you've ever had a, a citrus smelling variety of cannabis, if you've ever smoked or consumed something that really, really had that super citrus scent and you got the giggles and you felt really happy and, and upbeat, well, that was limonene doing its job. And, and that's the, that's the way that I found is most effective to explain terpenes by drawing analogies to, uh, 
to other experiences that are common with people, even like linalool, a terpene commonly found in lavender. I invite people to think about um, wearing one of those neck pillows that are stuffed with lavender or even just smelling a sprig of lavender, getting a massage with some lavender oil. Um, that Those are all experiences of consuming the terpene linalool. And, and how does that make you feel? Well, typically it, it makes people feel... Um, de-stressed and relaxed and chill. Well, if you have linalool in a high concentration in cannabis and you consume it, you may also uh, find that you're having that experience as well. Oh, those are some of the best ones. Uh, mm. The other one I really like is how mangoes can enhance your hive. It's an old trick from the golden age of Arabic science. And that these terpenes change so much how the cannabinoids go into your system. It's one of the things that is so fascinating. Even little bits of these smelly molecules can make a big difference in what a cannabis cultivar feels like. Yes, yes. And, and another analogy that I use when describing the relationship between cannabinoids and terpenes is that think of cannabinoids like the engine of the car. It is driving the experience. It is kicking the experience into gear to, to move it, um, to move it along. The terpenes are like the steering wheel. They're steering it in a direction of sleepy, giggly, uh, chill, relaxing, um, pain relieving, whatever it, it may be. They're the ones that are actually steering the experience um, towards, towards a certain feeling. And you are absolutely right to say that the cannabinoids and terpenes, they do work together synergistically to create the overall experience. Um, the, the terpenes definitely help the cannabinoids uh, effectively absorb into our physiology to more effectively bind to our receptors. Um, and that is, that's an example of the entourage effect, which is that theory that all compounds within the cannabis matrix work together synergistically to produce the overall experience. Wow, that is a beautiful analogy. It's like you've studied years to, to come up with these. <laughs> um, in, in fact, so then you started working with the Sativa Science Club and began their core science certification program. Uh, I was curious uh, what you cover in that program. Definitely. So I did team up with Sativa Science Club uh, now about a year ago to help them create their core science certification. And that covers quite a wide range of topics. So we look at cannabis botany, cannabis compounds, so cannabinoids, terpenes, um, as well as flavonoids. We also look at the endocannabinoid receptor system. We look at different product knowledge and consumption methods. And then we also look at client care. Um, and, and that uh, is now delivered through the Sativa Science Club online. Anybody could go and, and take those classes and, and get that certification. Oh, wow. That's a great offering. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am also currently um, working on a program that I will launch myself since cannabis is so so quickly moving, especially in the scientific world, it's ever changing, right? That constant um, flux. Uh, I, I'm going to be launching a, um, a, a new workshop series, a kind of like workshop series 2.0 that will really focus on the, the necessary things that, um, that bud tenders should learn before they step out onto the showroom floor and, and help somebody. And so that will be launching um, soon, about a week from now, which is exciting. Where can people go to find out more information on that? So that um, you can go to my website, emmachason.com, and just reach out to me if you want to get on the email list um, for, for the announcement, um, which will be coming, like I said, in the next week or so. Um, you can also always look to my social media, media in particular my Instagram, um, which I, I kind of shout out all the things that I have going on constantly and keep people up to date there. Um, well, before I let you go, is there anything else that you'd want to uh, announce or any other things you're excited about coming up in the cannabis world? Mm, I, I also have a radio show on um, X-Ray FM, which is a local radio here in Portland. Uh, the radio show also is available as a podcast as well. It's called This is Cannabis. Uh, it's a great way to really 
get access to uh, free cannabis education. Um, I get a lot of questions all the time about how people can uh, continue to learn about cannabis, how they can break out into the cannabis space, especially for those who live in non-legal states. Podcasts um, like this one are great ways to download a lot of really good um, cannabis knowledge and information, not only around the science, but also about the kind of like entrepreneurial journey. Well, that's excellent. All right. I will, we will link to that in uh, podcast in the episode notes so everybody can find it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for, for sharing all of your knowledge about this uh, subject. And we look forward to hearing more as the work continues. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a, a joy to talk to you today. All right. Thank you, Emma. Greener Grass is a Bluebird Botanicals podcast. Their CBD oil supports a healthy body and a strong endocannabinoid system. They've got friendly customer service who can answer any of your questions, and the number is right there at the top of their webpage. But, per the FDA, they won't be able to make any medical claims for these nutritional supplements. That's also the reason you'll hear little about CBD on this show. There's no need for us to add more evidence about CBD when a simple Google search will give you more than you can read in a month of Sundays. So this show covers the cannabis world and more with editorial freedom from Bluebird Botanicals. Thanks for joining the Greener Grass Podcast. As always, our audio alchemist is Matt Payne. The Gypsy Jazz theme music comes from Brett Van Donsel. Our beautiful bird sounds are courtesy of Lang Elliott. And I'm your host, Lex Pelger, wishing you a bright green day.